I, uh, I too, as was mentioned earlier, want to welcome all of you to the northwest region of the Denver Church of Christ. We're a church that spans throughout the entire metro area, and we have as many as five different services on Sunday, and I'm really grateful that you chose to be a part of this one here today. Sometimes we have people visiting from some of our other regions scattered throughout the, the, the metro area, or even from some of our sister congregations, and I want to welcome you if you're one of those people, or if you've come here the first time. I met a few people who came for the first time, found us on the website, walked in the door. We're especially honored that you guys chose to be with us here today. Looks like most people sat in this section. So I like to observe those things. Not sure what's going on over here. Okay, we'll be feeling that in the weeks to come. I missed not preaching last week, but didn't Andre Pearson do an incredible job talking about hope worldwide? I love the way our church is remembering the poor and is invested throughout the Denver area as well as around the world to meet the needs of of the needy, of the poor and needy all over. Two weeks ago, we met congregationally. Actually, we're just going to do that. I think it's four or five, I think four times this entire year, we have all of our regions come together. And so we did that two weeks ago. If you came here to this building on that day and you're like, where'd they all go? Okay, you didn't miss the boat. We're not all up in heaven. And you're like, oh, I knew I should have repented. We just were at a different service. Okay, and the next time we do that is going to be in in, uh, June, I believe it is, June 8th. But until then, we'll just be here each and every morning, so please keep coming back. We're going to start here today with a verse that we're going to use, kind of a, it's a cool passage. We're going to use it as a springboard for the lesson today and then the lesson next week. It's really a good, um, kind of a pre-Easter type inspirational passage to look at. So I think it'll be able to inspire us and meet our needs. I'll flash the scriptures up here, or you can turn there in your Bibles, beginning in John chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. Now, a man named named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Okay, so Jesus got this word that. You know, the one you love, of course, of course, everybody kind of felt that way around Jesus. I'm the one he loves. You know, he loved everybody like that. But but he got this word that this one he loved is sick. And so he's like, I'm not that worried. God's going to be glorified. Well, he kind of like dilly dallied for four days, got there a little bit late. And unfortunately, the guy had been long dead. Okay, so we're going to pick up there in verse 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off their grave clothes and let him go. It's a cool story, right? Doesn't matter how many times you read this story, kind of like a good movie, kind of like watching Frozen. We were talking about Frozen and the the, the girls before the service were like, oh, my gosh, I've watched that movie ten times. I can't stop watching it. That's kind of what happened here with Lazarus, okay? It's kind of one of those stories that you like to just keep hearing about. And you, you kind of kind of paint the picture that this guy was dead, Middle Eastern son. He's like locked in a tomb, cave, you know, there. And then with this big, big stone laid across the entrance. And even his sister is like, Jesus, don't open it up. It's going to stink really bad. And that's gross. But you know what it's like when you see a dead animal or something. You can have something as small as like well, down south where we grew up, uh, an armadillo. You guys ever seen armadillos? Not a lot of armadillos out here. When you like go by an armadillo, that small little, probably about eight pounds of flesh, they stink really bad when they've been killed and dead, sitting out in the sun for a while. Imagine a whole human body. So even the sister, as much as she wanted Jesus to interface with her with her brother, she's like, oh, no, please don't open it. It's going to stink really badly. You see where her mind was. And Jesus goes, come on, come on. I can do anything. Take, take out the, the stone. So they roll away the stone. That odor may have come out right then. And, and then he just cries. He calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. 
And it's kind of cool. He cries in a loud voice. You go, if he wouldn't have been loud, would Lazarus go, I can't hear you, man. Was, was that for me? Like, you know, did, did you really, was it the volume of the voice? I don't know. Jesus just kind of wanted to paint the scene there. And, and then it's interesting that he called him by name. Maybe there was a bunch of other dead guys in there and they thought, who's coming? Oh, man, it's just Lazarus. You know, it's like on Price is Right, you know, come on down. They're like, Lazarus always gets picked. You know, when is Jesus going to call me out? But he called Lazarus. The others go, darn, Jesus walks out, or, or Lazarus walks out in his grave clothes, and the people are just blown away. An incredible miracle. It's like a movie. It reads like a movie. This story has stirred the hearts of readers for 2,000 years. It's been captured in so many different ways with books written about it. It's been in movies. You know, you see the Son of God and things like that. You see depictions of it, as well as in art. And it's really interesting to see some of the most um, climactic moments in biblical history were, were captured through art. Artists just thought, wow, this is such a moving thing. How can I capture the essence of that in a sculpture or in a painting? I'm going to give you a few examples of this. Here's a picture of Lazarus. You can look at it, the screen up there. Is this coming through? Okay, yeah. So, uh, so you can see Lazarus in there kind of like, you know, wrapped up in the clothes. There he is, you know, stinking a little bit, but getting fresher by the minute. And Jesus just points out, you know, Lazarus come out. And this was like from the, from the 1400s, this painting. You go back a little bit earlier, not quite the color, but this was in the 400s. So in the 400s A.D., just about, about 300 years after Jesus or so, you see this example of Jesus, you know, just kind of calling him out. Then if you go back even more, 300 A.D. So this is just a couple hundred years after Jesus here, about 270 years or something after Jesus. You see, Jesus has lost his hand. OK, unfortunately, it's broken off there. But, but you can see, you know, the, the little almost mummified Lazarus just sitting there. It's kind of cute. You know, it looks like a little kid's toy or, you know, McDonald's toy or something like that. But, but you can just see how people were trying to capture the, the, the essence of this incredible miracle with the paintbrush with sculpting. They're just like, we, we've got to document this for the ages. And this art and so many others, you can do a Google image on it and just see so many cool paintings. It's traumatic. It's inspiring. But beyond the drama of what transpired here, what I really like is this one powerful, pregnant line from Jesus. Did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God. That was one of those moments that you picture Jesus looking into their eyes with those eyes like blazing fire. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? And you kind of picture Martha's going, we did in fact say that, you know, and I get the feel I'm about to see it right now. Jesus says this. It's such a cool line. And, and you know, it wasn't just for her that if you believe you'd see the glory of God. It's for all of us, because don't we all, if we're really honest, don't we want to see the glory of God? We get inspired reading about it in biblical passages. I, I get inspired. I get inspired hearing good news of God doing glorifying amazing things. All around the world. I, I love that. But call it selfish or call it spiritually ambitious. Sometimes I want to see it with my own eyes. I just want to see the glory of God. If we're honest, we all kind of feel that way. We want to see it in our church. Don't we feel that way about the Denver church? Those of you who have been members for a long time, you go, man, I want to see the glory. I want to see the church strengthening and spreading throughout the whole world. Or we feel that way about the Northwest region, this specific region of the church. We go, man, we have great visions, great dreams, great aspirations and ambitions, expectations for what God is doing in our midst. We want to see him strengthen the family here. And we want to see him spread the family. We want to see lives changed with our own eyes. We want to see the miracles. We want to see that in our family groups. We have family groups that are groups of like five or ten, and we, we subdivide the entire church into these small family groups. So we have people that are involved in each other's lives, where we're not just kind of like sitting next to someone at church and like, see you next week, but maybe not, you know, where it's like loosey-goosey, but we're involved in each other's lives, and we really become a family in those small groups, and we want to see the glory of God in those small groups. We want to see our groups strengthen. We want to see our groups spread. We want to see the glory of God in our own families as well, our physical families. We look at our spouses. We look at our kids. 
Don't you want to see God's glory reflected in the people you love the most? You want to see it in our friends' lives. We all have friends that maybe are not churchgoers, that maybe they don't have much faith, and we wish for their marriage to be transformed by the power of God. We wish for their families to be united by the grace of God. We wish for them to be able to overcome bad habits and sinful traps by the power of God. We want to see the glory of God in our friends' lives. And if we're really honest, we want to see the glory of God when we look in the mirror. Not thinking that we're so awesome. No, because we're not seeing ourselves. But we want to look at our lives and go, I cannot believe. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. But His grace has brought me safe thus far. And you just go, wow, look where I am. I think about my life. I go, I used to be an atheist. I mean, I was like publicly debating groups like this, standing up saying, there is no God. God is not real. The Bible's a lie. And now I look and sometimes I'll see a, an image or something online of, of me preaching. And I just go, oh my gosh, I have this flashback of standing at Free Speech Alley at LSU debating against the existence of God. And I go, it's just the glory of God. And there's so many other areas presently that I look and I go, I'd like to see more glory in that area. God, help me transform. But don't we want to see it in our own lives? We want to see God working to transform us and to change us. We all, like the sister there, want to see the glory of God. Well, here, Jesus says the key to seeing real glory is having real belief. The key to seeing real glory is having real belief. So what I want to do is I want to take a couple weeks, this week and next week, again, as we're kind of building up to Easter and studying out a resurrection story, I want us to consider what kind of belief is it that will really allow you and me and us to truly see the glory of God. Not just at some point in the future, though, God willing, we will see it in the future, but right now. What kind of belief? will allow us to see the glory of God. This week, I want to talk about two dimensions of such belief that allow us to see the glory of God. And then next week, we're going to talk about two more dimensions that will allow us to see the glory of God. The first dimension is this. We want belief that sees the glory of God. It is first, belief that is rooted in God. Belief that is rooted in God. In Romans 4, verse 17, we'll pick up kind of mid-passage here as the Bible's talking about Abraham. Verse 17 of chapter 4, as it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God in whom he believed. The God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he's about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. It's another great passage. Abraham was known and referred to, even through the Holy Spirit, as the father of faith. That's a pretty amazing thought to think of. He gave birth to faith. He brought it into the world. He allowed it to be, to be brought into the world. He, he, he defined what faith is. I think of how proud I am to be the father of two daughters, I love my daughters, Jana and Marin. They're not perfect, maybe in your eyes. In my eyes, they are. You know, they're awesome. I love my girls, and they're both graduating next month, one from college, one from high school. And it's going to be a big May. It's my youngest daughter's birthday, and then two graduations, and Barry's family's going to come into town. I I really take great pride and and gratitude for being able to give birth. I didn't give birth. My wife gave birth, but I kind of helped, you know. She's like, what? You You didn't do anything, man. We gave birth, okay, to these two beautiful daughters. Imagine the satisfaction that Abraham would feel. Saying, you know what I did? I gave birth to faith. You're like, wow, that's pretty impressive, Abe. You know, that is pretty impressive, to give birth to faith. 
But here we see what made his faith so potent. It was deeply rooted in a deep knowledge and understanding of God himself. See, I think the problem with many of our faiths is that they're rooted in things other than God. And we don't even really know it at times. Sometimes our faith can be rooted in desire. We want something so bad, and we're thinking about how badly we want it. We want this, or we want that. And I don't mean selfish things. It's not like, I want to win the lottery. You know, I want to win now. You know, I don't mean like that, but maybe you want someone to be healed, or you want a new job, or you want your heart to change, whatever. A very, a very selfless motive, but, but our faith sometimes is rooted more in what we want than in really focusing on who God is. Sometimes our faith is rooted in emotion. We can get really psyched up. We can get really hyped up. This, this is a challenge like of having a, a young ministry like the teens. I love our teen ministries. You, you know, there is a strength when you come together as a group, a Bible talker, say the teen devotional or something. You come together, everybody's around you. They get all hyped up. They're like praying together. Like, man, I want to I wanna evangelize a billion people tomorrow. You know, and they're like, yeah, bro. And we get really hyped up. And there's a good part to that. We need one another. But there's a dangerous part that sometimes our faith is more rooted in emotion and hype than it really is in a deep understanding of God himself. Or sometimes our faith is rooted in tradition. You go, well, why do you believe? Because I always have. Well, why do you pray? Because we're supposed to. Because everybody else does. Well, who really are you praying to? God. You know, and it's just... It's simple and it's easy, but it's kind of formulaic and it's more like it's rote, it's tradition rather than real root and depth. Sometimes our faith, rather than being rooted in God, is rooted in people. We want to please people. We want people to respect us. We, we love that they are building our faith. They're trying to inspire us. They expect great things. And so our faith is more centered on pleasing other people. Or, or, or listening to what other people think of us, rather than really focusing on who God is. Sometimes our faith is rooted in repetitious prayer. We think, if I just ask for it enough, then he'll finally give it to me. There's like that commercial, it's some cartoon, I forget what it is, Barry and I always laugh about it, where this little guy's like, Mama, 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 mama. You know that cartoon? You guys ever see that commercial? And it's just like after a while, he's like, what is it? You know, sometimes we think of our prayer like that. You know, it's like, God, 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 God. And it's kind of like, eventually I'm going to wear them out. And I know there's the parable of the persistent widow. I get that. But sometimes our faith is more in our method of prayer. If I just repeat it enough, it'll work because I've done my part. I've done enough. And kind of on that same note, and this is kind of a challenge one, sometimes our, our faith is rooted in well-worded prayer. If we use just the right adjectives, if we use just the right spiritual adverbs, if we use just enough King James English thrown in there, and, and if we say it in just the right way, then it's going to work. But if you don't say it that way, it's not going to work. Oh, bro, that other prayer is not going to work. And, and, and we're really missing the point of God, like, when my daughter was a little kid, you know, like two years old or one and a half years old, when they would utter little things, do I listen to them? Did I listen to them less then because they didn't sound as good as they do now? No, if, if anything, it's more. But you listen to their heart. You listen to the, to the raw passion coming out of them. You don't listen to the fine sounding words. But sometimes we, like the Pharisees, can think we're heard because of the length of our prayers. And because of how colorfully we've learned how to pray. We hear someone pray in public like, wow, that guy's an awesome prayer. God must answer his prayers more. Really? Is our faith in, in the way we pray? Or is our faith in God himself? Sometimes our faith is rooted in pride. That we just think, I've always gotten what I want. I think I'm one of his favorites. I think he's just going to give me what I'm asking for. And so we're kind of thinking about what we deserve and what we're worthy of. And we're thinking about ourselves, again, more than we're thinking about God. I could go on and on. There's a lot of things that our faith is rooted in. And we wonder why we don't see the glory of God. Well, because our faith is rooted in something other than God. We'll see the glory of man. We'll see the glory of fine-sounding prayer. We'll see the glory of, of people. We'll see the glory of tradition. We'll see the glory of ourselves. But we won't see the glory of God. 
if our faith is not deeply rooted in God. So you look here at what this passage says about Abraham and you can see the root of his belief that made him the father of faith. I'll highlight these phrases here. He starts off, it talks about the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. I love that. That's the newer NIV. Remember the, the old NIV, the 78 NIV would say, calls things that are not as though they were. And that's a good one. But this says, calls into being things that were not. This thing was not. And then God just, bam, called it into being. Something from nothing. It, just denying the, the whole law of physics that something can't come from nothing. But, but God can make that happen. He created all the laws. So you see how he's talking about the kind of God he is. He's just this kind of God. Then you look further down where he talks about he didn't waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. He thought about the promise of God. God has promised this. He wasn't just thinking about what he wanted. He wasn't just thinking about how he's going to pray. He's thinking about the promise of God. And then the final thing, he reasoned. He was fully persuaded that God had power. To do what he promised. He goes, if God promises, God has the power. If God said he would, and I certainly know he has the power, then he will. You see, just in this one passage, you can see what makes Abraham's faith so potent. It wasn't focused on man. It wasn't focused on self. It wasn't focused on colorfully sounded prayers. It was just focused on who God is. You want belief that sees the glory of God? Get deeper in your knowledge your understanding, your insight about who God really is, about who Jesus really is. We could all like check the boxes. Do you believe Jesus, son of God? Yes. You know, we can all kind of we know the basics. But but how much more do you know? How many times have you like linked verses where you go, oh, maybe nobody's ever seen this before. Oh, this is a nugget. I've learned something about God where the word is just stimulating you and you feel like I'm, I'm on this journey of getting to know God. And I know him more now than I did 10 years ago. I know him more now than I did in January of this year. Are you on that kind of a journey to really deepen your understanding of God? See, this is why in the church here we talk so much about studying the Bible. We talk all the time to, to members, to one another about reading the Bible every day, but having your daily devotion. We call it a quiet time. Quiet time doesn't mean you just sit there and chill, you know, but you kind of like chill from the world, but you focus on God. You meditate on who he is. We talk a lot about that because we believe that's the foundation, not Sunday services. This isn't the foundation. This is an extra celebration of our of our partnership. And yes, we inspire one another, meet other others needs like Lex was talking about. But our daily personal walk with God, opening the word and getting fed, putting on the glasses to allow us to see God more clearly. That's why we emphasize studying the Bible so much. If you're a guest here today, chances are somebody's going to come to you and say, hey, let's meet for a coffee this week or something. Let's just open the Bible and look at some scriptures. Well, they're not trying to be like holy rollers and all weird. We just love to do that. We love to sit down with friends and, and just talk about the Bible, not in some weird way, but, but just the opposite to show how the Bible can really resonate with us, how it can really help our marriages, how it can really help our parenting, how it can really help our grades, how it can really help our joy, how it can help our friendships, how it can, it can, it can change any and every area of our lives. But beyond even just studying the Bible, to consider and meditate on God more. Sometimes we have a lot of Bible in us, but we don't just meditate on it. Sometimes we can sit down and read the Bible, and you read it. You're on your daily Bible reading. I've been doing that. You know, I'm doing this read through the Bible in a year and day, whatever it is. You know, but I do that every day. And some days I'll skip, and then I'll do two the next day. But I want to stay caught up. But sometimes I find myself just reading to read. And I can read a whole section. I can check it off in my little Bible app. I read it. And then if somebody said, what would you read? I go, I don't know. You, you ever do that? Like, so it's not even enough to just read it or know where it is, but but to really consider, hmm, who is he? Hmm, what does he think of me? Hmm, how does he, how does he want to work in my life to really understand the character and heart and dreams and passions of God more deeply? Such is the foundation of real belief. And see, when you remember his power and you consider his promises, you really can persuade yourself and your doubts melt away because you're focused and rooted in him. For example, maybe we wonder kind of the age old question, can I change? 
Yeah, but I'm, I'm 50 whatever. Can I change? Well, this is, I think, who I'm going to be for the rest of my life. Well, I'm 17. Can I change? Well, I'm 32. Can I change? Wherever we at, we're at, we find a reason to doubt. Can I really change at that stage of life? The patterns are too deep. The peer pressure is too great. I'm too young. I'm too old. You know, young people go, when I get older, then I'll really worry about changing. Old people go, I'm too old to change. I mean, we're always thinking that there's some reason we can't change. So ultimately, we wonder, can I change blank? Overcoming lust or alcohol or anger, impatience, deceit, overeating. For me, there's times that I wonder, can I stop eating this ice cream? I mean, I really do. I like grew up eating ice cream. I worked at Baskin Robbins where they let us take home our mistakes. That was a mistake of the owner. Because every night at like 9.59, I'd make a big old Matterhorn mistake. That's like seven scoops with seven toppings. I'd make that. Oh, I made a mistake. You know, and I'd take it home. And, but even to this day, Barry will be like, honey, put the ice cream away. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's like half gone. And I just, I, I don't struggle with chemical dependency, but I can really relate. I'm not kidding with like Twix bars or ice cream. I mean, I can just like, if I have one Twix at Halloween, Then I'll just go, just one more, just one more. Then I'll go, just eat them all, and tomorrow, you know, you won't do it. And I get so many wrappers. I just, I'll be so embarrassed, I'll shove all the wrappers way down in the trash can, because my wife will go, good Lord, who ate all the Twix bars, you know? And, and And I laugh about it, but we all have areas that we wonder, can I change that? And so you think about it. If you think about having your faith rooted in God, you go, Twix bar. Versus the God who created me. The God who spoke the world into existence. The God who raises the dead. The God who promises in question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You look at the Twix bar. You look at the God of the universe. And your doubts melt away. Or we wonder, can I help others change? You look at your family, your kids your spouse, your marriage, your loved ones, your friends, your co-workers, and you see them so stuck in their way of thinking, in some pattern of behavior, and you go, I've tried, I've tried, I, I just don't think they're going to be able to change. We wrestle with that, don't we? We want them to change, but we wonder, will they really change? Will my kids become disciples? Will my kids make it to heaven? Will this guy, this girl, my spouse, will they ever really change? Sometimes we can have faith that we can change, but we don't have faith that others can change. Well, you think about it, that friend or family member, their weakness or sin that you're considering. And then you go, versus the God who healed the cripple, who gave sight to the blind, who made the deaf hear, who raised the dead, and who said in promise, nothing will be impossible for you. See, you look at who God is. And if your belief is rooted in who God is, you, your, your doubts just melt away. We need, first of all, if we're going to have a belief that sees the glory of God right here, right now, we've got to have a belief that is rooted in God. Amen to that? The second dimension here today, and we'll conclude with this, the second dimension of a faith, a belief, that really will see you, allow you to see the glory of God is belief that's refined by fire. Belief that's refined by fire. 1 Peter chapter 1. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. I like this passage. It's another one like Romans, like John, that we've probably read a million times. But the Bible's only so thick, and the longer you've been a Christian, the more millions of times you will have read every passage, right? And so the challenge is to look at them as though you've never heard them before and let them kind of break new ground within your heart. So I look at this and I think about Peter. Peter's been a disciple at this point perhaps as long as 50 years. 50 years, the first 50 years of Christianity, the first three and a half walking with the master himself. Right after that, he watched Jesus ascend to heaven. Then he preached and saw 3,000 get baptized in the first day. 
Then he saw horrible persecution break out. He watched all kinds of like hell break loose. I mean, he saw so much persecution, so much challenge. He saw Christians probably probably burned at the stake and killed. I mean, he saw so much. And so here as he writes this letter, he's passing on an insight as this elder. Literally, he's an elder, but as just an older disciple, too. He's passing it on to all the churches, to us, going, chapter one of my first letter. Let me tell you something I've learned. You're going to face challenges in life. But there's all there's a purpose behind it all. You'll wonder, why is God doing this? Why doesn't God take away the challenge? And he explains it because trials are one of God's primary tools to refine your faith. It's not the tool we prefer. I rather just that I will bestow blessing on you. Bam! Kind of thing. I'm like, use that tool all you want, God. I will believe more if you just do more miracles in my midst. You know, sometimes I think I know the better plan to give me faith. God prefers using trials. I'm like, okay, I'll trust you with that one. So the trials he gives, Paul or Peter explains, he goes, it's not unlike this process of refining gold. That the metallurgist, as you know, the story would take all this gold from the ground. They clean it as much as they could. And, but, but then the only way they could get it really purified is to heat it up. And they put it in a big cauldron, just like you see in this image. They put it in a big cauldron. And they heat it up, heat it up. And dense, the density of gold is so great, it sinks to the bottom. All the lighter impurities float to the top. And they take a big skimmer and they skim it off and throw it to the side. That's called the dross. All these, these extra pieces are reprobate. So they're thrown over to the side and then they heat it up more and it bubbles up. And the more it bubbles, the more impurities are forced to the surface and they skim it off like that. And, and the metallurgist will keep doing that, heating it up more and more until he can see kind of like you can tell in the, in the image here, a reflection. When you can see a reflection, he looks in and can see the outline of his face in the molten gold. Then he knows this has been refined enough. This is pure. I see myself in this molten molten gold. Well, God wants us to have such a faith that he looks down at us and sees himself. There's no ugly John in between. There's just Jesus through the eyes of faith being reflected back. What an amazing thing. Well, for that to happen, he's got to put some big hot logs under your rear end. He's got to heat your life up. And then when you just think, oh, I made it through those logs, he looks and he goes, I'm heating you up some more. And life is just a perpetual cyclical process of heating you up more and more and more. And just when you think you've arrived, you have enough faith, you don't need any more trials, you get a few more logs coming your way. And he's just going to do that until he returns. That's just the process of proving our faith genuine. The challenge is not. Will he try to refine your faith? He is. The challenge is when you face those trials, will they refine your faith or reduce your faith? Sometimes the very trials that were intended to refine our faith actually reduce our faith. We all face a lot of trials. It was prayed earlier. Maybe you had a hard week. Even in our pre kind of plan pre-service meeting somebody talked about that maybe you've had a really hard week afton's on spring break she's like not me i was on spring break and and like and we go well next week's gonna be really hard get ready you know you're going back but the same thing for the teams you go this was an awesome week well it'll be hard next week maybe so you know you just kind of buckle up because you know it's going to be hard i remember this this story and i love the story some of you that know me for a while have heard this story i had this friend when i was in theology school in memphis one of my friends lived in northern mississippi and his name was stan stan bowling really good no nonsense guy the kind of salt of the earth, blue collar worker. He always fixed my car, which I really appreciate because I always broke. One time Stan tells me the story. He goes, hey, John, yesterday I was digging a hole in my backyard. And I could tell the whole story in, te- in Stan voice, but it'd take me like 15 minutes. You know, that's just the way Stan talks. So I'm just going to speed it up and talk in my voice. So he's like, I'm, I'm digging this hole in my backyard. I'm digging. And he said, right as he scooped one scoop deep, as he's thrown, he's just in this motion. You know how you get in a groove like this? And he's, he's, right as he scoops up, he noticed he scooped up a little mole. He, like, dug it out of the ground. And he's like, oh, look at that mole. But he was too late to stop. And he threw it over. You know, he's throwing the dirt back. Well, as he throws it, the little mole, like, is just, like, going in the air. And it starts to come down. And right then, this hawk swoops down, 
grabs them all. And he's like, ah! you know, it's like, I mean, it's right there in front of him. Grabs them all in its talons and starts flying over the house and stands like, look at that. And it's flying over the house. And then right as it gets over the house, right in the, there's a street in front of the house, it, it, it wiggled loose and it got loose from the talons of the hawk. It fell down on the ground. And, and then this truck was coming right by and squishes them all right in the middle of the street. And, and Stan is like, God, that was weird, man. That was like a like an acid trip or something like that. I mean, all in a matter of like eight seconds, this this little calm mole is like buried deep in the cool, moist, dark area. Then he's like scooped out of the ground, thrown in the air, grabbed by a hawk, flown over a house, dropped in the street and squished by a truck. That was a bad day for them all. And our lives sometimes are not that indifferent. You ever feel like you're having a mole day? You just kind of go, everything that could go wrong is going wrong. Or maybe you have a mole week. Or maybe you use some kind of like, um, you know, Asian symbol. You go, this is the year of the mole. You know, where it's like, it just keeps going bad and bad. We all have days like that. We all have weeks like that. There's no doubt about it. We're going to face trials. There's no doubt. All of us. If we all just stood up and shared, let's just share some bad news. Let's just have some honest bad news. What, what bad is going on? I lost my job. You know, I got so sick. You know, my wife is really struggling. I'm struggling. Like we could share a lot. We try to act like we don't have trials, but we all do. We all face so many trials where every time you face a trial, your faith is tested. And it will either at that point be refined or reduced. I think for young Christians... Sometimes that first big trial, it's huge because our faith is so relatively small. It's kind of a newbie. You know, it's just a new faith. And and that first trial, the first persecution, the first call from an ex-girlfriend, the first big sinful temptation or failure, the first big flop, something happens and boom, your faith is gone. It's just the trial comes. Faith is reduced. There's nothing left there. And you see people quickly fall away because they have no root, right? Haven't we seen that? Just like the parables. Haven't you known friends that they get baptized and then like the very next Sunday, you're like, where are they? That old, that old girlfriend called them. Like, it's so predictable. Satan knows that he can get them because their faith is small. And so one trial, their faith is, is, is reduced to zero. But as older Christians, there's a different process that takes place. We face trials. Persecution, struggles, life, you know, financial struggles, physical struggles, whatever. We all face these kind of trials and we don't realize we think we're persevering because we're not leaving. We're still putting one foot in front of the next, but we don't realize that gradually our faith is being reduced. We start dreaming less. We start aspiring to less. We start expecting more kind of normality rather than miracle. And we think we're becoming more mature. We hear some young Christians and they're like pie in the sky belief of what God can do. And we're like, oh, yes, young grasshopper, you will learn that nothing like that happens in life once you get older. And sometimes we think we're being mature. But what's happened is the trials of life have reduced our faith blow by blow, mole day by mole day, mole year by mole year. So we're still there, but we've become kind of cynical and kind of more humanistic than spiritual. You want real faith that sees the glory of God? Let your trials refine your faith and not reduce your faith. Key point in my life when I really learned this for the first time and I keep relearning it. Matter of fact, it's one of the things I keep relearning every time I go to this place. It's being in Bangkok, Thailand. Most faithless, faithless place I know of on, on, the, on the map. I mean, literally. Freedom of Christianity there for hundreds of years, but less than one half of 1% Christian believing of any kind. There's just something about that place that you go there and it's so beautiful and exotic, but it just sucks the faith right out of you. I felt it. I felt it from day one. Like you could just feel the black hole of darkness. Just your, your faith just get vacuumed out. And I remember somebody telling me, hey, in Bangkok, you miss one quiet time. OK, you miss two. You're dead. It just it just takes too much faith, too, too much faith is out of you every day. But I remember specifically a really challenging time that everything it was a mole time. Everything was going bad. My right hand guy fell into major sin. 
saw prostitutes, like capital prostitutes. He went to a prostitute. He thought about killing himself. He felt so guilty. He came over to my house right before a big retreat. He's supposed to do so much at the retreat. And he's like, John, and he looked like death warmed over. And he told me where he was at. I remember that. Then I remember getting typhoid right after that in the hospital. I thought I was going to die. I mean, literally at three in the morning, Barry can tell you, my, my feet are going numb and it's going. I'm literally watch, watching my feet and my shins and my knees about this fast. It's going up my body, going numb, going stiff. And I thought, once it gets to my heart, I'm going to die. I'm like, call an ambulance now. It's like, I mean, I got like three seconds. You know, I'm like, there's no hope if that's going to happen. But I really, and I'm like, I didn't die. Okay. But she took me there and, you know, to the hospital and was there for several days, you know, getting treated for typhoid. Right around that same time, I offended some guy that visited church and was telling him to repent. He didn't like it. And he hired somebody to try to kill me. That's what he said. I got these death threats. It was, it was horrible. I was scared to death. I carried my, my racquetball racket with me everywhere I went. I was like ready to waylay somebody. You know, literally it went with me everywhere. Why is he carrying a racquetball racket? Because I have no faith. And, <laughs> and then there was so much sin gone. The monsoons. We had this big Jesus night. We're like, man, this is going to be awesome. We're going to bring all our friends over. We're going to have faith. that hey, God can do anything. Bring them over to learn about Jesus. This monsoon comes in. And our street, I mean, literally there's water like this deep. You had to walk about half a mile down to get to my apartment. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, God, why have you done this? It's, it's amazing. Even that night, people came over. We had to give them a change of clothes because they're literally just soaking wet. Everybody who came over, and some still came. And they're all, we look around, they're all wearing Barry's clothes or my clothes. And they're sitting there, and, you know, we just preached about Jesus. God ended up doing some miracles. It really was amazing. But that time, I, I realized all these trials were coming, and my faith was just, it was getting knocked to nothing. I didn't give up. But I wasn't dreaming big. I wasn't expecting much. Then I remember Frank Kim, who was my boss over there. He was in Tokyo. And I remember him rebuking me with the word. I mean, really rebuking. Not just like, bro, come on. It'll be okay. He's like, brother, you need to repent of your lack of faith. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I called him up and I'm like, hey, Frank, there's this guy trying to kill me. I'm getting these death threats. What do I do? And I left message after message. Finally, I got a hold of him and he goes, John, here's the thing. Everybody's got to go sometime. That's literally what he said. I'm like... Oh, like, Barry goes, what did he say? I go, he said, I got to go sometime. And I just need to trust in God. I can't believe he said that. I go, that's what he said. He since apologized because I did have to bring that up with him years later. It was kind of a sore spot. But, but, but I, I was just kind of panicking. And, but then Frank's rebuke for my lack of faith actually turned those, those, those trials that were reducing my faith into the very things that refined my faith. And Bangkok went from this place that sucked the faith out of me to this place that my faith grew like nowhere else on earth. I love going back there because I go back like last summer, went back. I got sick in the hospital four days. I mean, same kind of thing. I mean, so many challenges. Nobody's becoming a Christian. I'm like, oh, yeah, I remember this. <laughs> I, remember, I remember what this is like. And, and people were struggling while they're there. They're like, how come nobody's becoming a Christian? I'm like, just believe. Our daughter was one of them. And we told all these stories. We said, if, if Satan can't get you spiritually, he's going to get you physically. I get put in the hospital right after that. This other guy, the first day he arrived, one of our interns, Tyler, he, he like tears his ACL day one. And so he has to go to the hospital and get this cast and everything. And if people were just getting sick, dropping like flies. Nobody's becoming a Christian. We're like, just believe, just believe. At the end of the summer, one person had gotten baptized. And our daughter was, was over there. And we were fired up about that one getting baptized. But she's like, I really prayed that someone would become a Christian. And we go, just believe, Janet. Well, it's, it's August. We're coming back. And nobody's gotten baptized. Yeah, but some of your friends, the word has been planted out there. You've reached out to so many. Just believe, keep believing. Well, she kept persevering, persevering. Seven months later, last week, we see on Facebook this image. This girl that Jana and Stephanie Lefevre met, her, she, she got baptized just last week in Bangkok. See that little girl in the center right there? They're all kind of little over there in Thailand. I, that's why I like living over there. I feel like I feel tall. And so this girl gets baptized seven months after the team leaves. And you know what her name was? Her name is Long. That's literally her name. It's like her, she was born to take time to, to become a Christian. And so that long time that Jana is struggling, I'm watching her struggle. And I go, I know what it's like in Bangkok, but trust me, God is bigger than whatever you see. Just believe. And, and the, the faith of the mission team, they persevered and they're still bearing fruit. That's just the power of God. God does that. He does those things. What kind of trials are you facing? Really? Right now? What trials are you facing? 
relational challenges, conflicts, emotional challenges, financial challenges, physical challenges, spiritual challenges, personal habitual pattern challenges. We're all going to face trials. We're all going to face challenges. Jesus says, in this word, you will have success, beauty. In this world, you will have, what's he say? John 16, trouble. Thanks a lot, Jesus. There's a good promise. I want to, I'm going to cling to that promise. In this world, you have trouble. You were right. You are. That's just the way it is. We're going to have trouble. But the challenge is this. You're, you're on the track to be developed when you're facing those trials. You've not been taken off the potter's wheel. You're on the potter's wheel. Don't let your faith be reduced by those trials. Rather, learn the lessons. Dig deeper. Enjoy the burn. And let your faith be refined by those challenges. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? We all need to have belief that sees the glory of God. We got to see it. We want to see glory in our lives, in our marriages, in our families, in our kids, in our family groups throughout the whole region, throughout this whole part of the world. We want to see God triumphantly march. We want to see His glory. We're just going, my eyes have seen the glory. We want to sing that song. Take these first two dimensions and understand what kind of belief it really takes to see the glory of God. It's belief that's rooted in God and it's belief that's refined by fire. Let's have that real belief. And brothers and sisters, we will see the glory of God. God bless you.